Hello and welcome to the Bradley Lectures podcast. I'm your host, Jackson Wolford. We've lived through our second straight presidential election that has defied forecasters' odds and are surrounded by a pandemic that has confounded planning and expectation. Amidst so much uncertainty, today we'll hear a 2015 lecture from Philip Tetlock, professor at the University of Pennsylvania, a lecture entitled Predicting the Future. But before we do, I wanted to drop a few quick, exciting pieces of information. First, if you would like to get in touch, we've set up an email for the podcast at bradleylecturespod at aei.org. If you have questions about old lectures, topics that would interest you to hear about in the future, or any other feedback, please feel welcome to reach out. Additionally, you can now follow the Bradley Lectures podcast on Twitter at the handle at Bradley Lectures. Follow for more information from the podcast on future and past episodes. Without further ado, here's Professor Tetlock on the possibility of predicting an uncertain future and the power of what he calls adversarial collaboration. The title of this presentation, I adapted it a little bit from what Sally gave me, predicting the future. How can we, how much better can we get when we get serious about keeping score? Now, there are some spheres of life in which this would be not at all a controversial question. It would be kind of a slam dunk. A friend of mine works at a big hedge fund, AQR. She's the chief risk officer. He's also a very good poker player. We talk about him in the book to some degree, briefly. And he has an interesting view of how to distinguish world-class players, and he is a world-class poker player, from talented amateurs. And the litmus test is the world-class players know the difference between a 55-45 bet and a 45-55 bet. They're granular in their assessments of uncertainty. Well, that turns out to be very true of super forecasters as well. They're granular in their assessments of uncertainty. Now, when I say that in the, in the context of poker or a number of other contexts as well, people sort of roll their eyes and say, well, Professor, that's, that's pretty obvious, isn't it, that that would pay off in, in a game like poker because you're sampling from a well-defined universe, you know, the deck of cards. There's repeated play. There's clear feedback, clear rapid feedback on accuracy. That's not exactly world politics, is it? That's not exactly the world that intelligence al- analysts work with. There's a lot more ambiguity. The events they're dealing with seem to be one-shot historical events. How do you construct a probability distribution around one-shot historical events? Isn't it impossible? How could you possibly become granular in your assessments of whether Greece is going to leave the Eurozone or what mischief Putin is up to or what's going to happen in the East China Sea and the Sino-Japanese forces there? Lots of questions that, of that sort that seem to be unique, one-shot historical events. How can you possibly do that? Now, I'm not going to get into a diversion into the philosophy of statistics, but there are two somewhat clashing schools of thought in statistics, one of which, the frequentist school of thought, essentially agrees with what I just said. And that is, boy, it's virtually impossible to move from the poker domain into the domain of world politics. The other, we call the frequentist school, the other school is the Bayesian school, which is that we're constantly estimating uncertainty, constantly making implicit probability judgments, and it's better that those implicit probability judgments become explicit. And if we do that, we will learn. I am, truth be told, on the Bayesian, in the Bayesian camp. I don't think it would make sense to have participated in the IRPA forecasting tournament if I were an orthodox frequentist. I simply would have said, I just don't think it's possible to get better. But rather than entrenching ourselves in these rival philosophical positions, which have existed for a very long time, I think IARPA took the very constructive step of, of treating it as a purely pragmatic empirical question. To what extent is it possible to make probability estimates of possible futures of world events more accurate? The answer to that question is quite a bit. It's possible to achieve really pretty substantial improvements. We run control groups in the IR forecasting tournaments. These control groups serve the function of giving us a baseline against which to measure whether or not there is improvement. And we can gauge how much we can improve accuracy by selecting elite forecasters and putting them into teams and giving them certain guidelines, by giving regular forecasters training, by giving regular forecasters the opportunity to work in teams, by using various kinds of statistical algorithms that distill wisdom from crowds. So there are many different techniques, psychological and statistical, we can use to test the hypothesis of whether or not it's possible to achieve improvement above and beyond that of a control group. And using the analogy of the Snell and eye chart, with which we are all familiar, of course, it's rather analogous to improving your vision from, say, 2100 to 2050. It's still going to be blurry. It's not going to be perfect but it's going to be substantially better. Our forecasters are not Nostradamus-style prophets. 
they simply have learned to become better at assigning realistic probability estimates to a wide range of outcomes of national security interest. That doesn't mean they're always right. It means that when things happen, on average, they're giving assigning probabilities somewhere between 72-76% in that range. And when things don't happen, they're assigning probabilities somewhere between about 24 and 28%. That's a lot better than 60, 40, 40, 60. So the right analogy here is not, the right model is not Nostradamus. It's not prophecy. It's optometry. It's a little pedestrian, <laughs> but optometry is the right framework for thinking. We're, we're talking about gradualist incremental improvements in probability estimates that were previously thought to be impossible. And that is, I think, the great discovery of the IRP tournament. And if I had to do this talk in this amount of time, I would simply end right there. That's exactly what's accomplished. How do we know all of this? We know all this because we run forecasting tournaments. And in these forecasting tournaments, we've had tens of thousands of forecasters. They've answered roughly 500 questions of national security relevance. They've done this over a period of four years. And in total, we have more than a million probability judgments. So we have a fair amount of raw data to work with. Now, forecasting tournaments are unusual. They're very different from things that you normally run into in life, very different from political games in Washington. They are pure accuracy games. That is all that matters, is who is closer to the truth on one. Who does a better job than whom in assigning higher probabilities to things that happen than to things that don't happen on resolvable questions of national security relevance? That's all that matters. It's not an ideology question. It's, pure, it's a purely pragmatic accuracy question. Forecasting tournaments are, as I, I think I use the term here, they destabilize stale status hierarchies. Status moves very slowly. Accuracy can change quite quickly. You know, I'm 61 years old. I've been running forecasting tournaments off and on since I was about 30 years old, 1984, back when there was a Soviet Union, before Gorbachev became general secretary. So I've been running a lot of forecasting tournaments. Imagine that I'm an analyst inside the CIA, or imagine I'm a senior China analyst on the National Intelligence Council. I'm the go-to guy when Xi Jinping shows up in town. I help write things for the PDB, presidential daily briefing. I help to craft national intelligence estimates. I'm the alpha dog among sinologists in the IC. And some research group, IARPA, Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, comes in and persuades someone like the Office of the Director of National Intelligence or people in that office to do some experiments and run some forecasting tournaments in which, say, 25-year-olds who just came in and are junior China analysts can compete on a level playing field with me. Now, it, I don't think it takes a great deal of bureaucratic imagination to suppose that I am not going to be very enthusiastic about this development. Right? Now, in the book, we talk about, we have a tale of Tom Friedman and Bill Flack. And Tom Friedman hasn't reacted to this yet, but it's essentially a story. But Tom Friedman is, of course, an alpha columnist. And Bill Flack is an anonymous super forecaster. He cranked out lots of forecasts over a number of years from his house, actually from a public library in Nebraska. He was a retired hydrologist, irrigation specialist in Nebraska. And we happen to know that he's a darn good forecaster. He's very good at assigning realistic probability estimates to events. And he's a really quick study because these questions are extremely heterogeneous. And he does a pretty good job of coming up with realistic probability estimates faster than, than, than other people do on the outside world. And in fact, his estimates are very competitive with those that intelligence analysts inside the community with access to classified information generate. David Ignatius in Washington Post wrote an article a few years ago which reported some of the early results of the tournament suggesting that the Good Judgment Project best forecasters and best algorithms could do better than analysts working inside the intelligence community. And he used the numbers 25 to 30 percent. I don't know where, how we managed to get this information because I don't think this information is publicly available. But of course, it's the Washington Post. So who knows? <laughs> they, 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 they have their ways of doing things. I have no reason to believe that's wrong. I, 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 in, in fact, I, I believe it to be true of other years as well. I don't believe it was just true of the second year. I think it was true of the third and the fourth year of the tournament as well. So that's interesting. And it's interesting why that is. I don't think it's because these so-called super forecasters I'm talking about here are more intelligent or more, even more open-minded than the intelligence analysts. I think it's because they think, they, they think it's really worth taking a shot on this. And they, they think that probability estimation of real world, messy real world events is a skill that can be cultivated and it's worth trying to cultivate it. They're willing to take a shot at it. If you take the view that, no, these are unique historical events, there's no way you can assign probability estimates to them, this is stupid. You know, if you do, if you take, if that's your attitude, it doesn't matter how high your IQ is or how open-minded you are on other topics, you're simply never going to try to do it. 
and you're never going to get better at it. Just as you know, children in high school who are convinced that you know, they don't like math and never try, never get better at it. It is a fundamental principle. This is a, one of those take it to the bank principles of psychology. <laughs> you, 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 you get, it's a necessary but not a sufficient condition for doing well. Okay. Most pundits do make forecasts, but the forecasts are framed in terms of vague verbiage. And when you look at vague verbiage forecasts, you discover just how vague they are. You can ask people, for example, what probability range is implied by this forecast in which the forecaster uses the word could or distinct possibility or whatnot. And what you find is that these, this one right here, it's a real possibility. Real possibility, the probability range, the imputed probability range from readers is from 0.22 to 0.89. That really covers a lot of territory. And that means, you know, it means never having to say you're sorry. <laughs> you know, if I said, I said it could happen and it doesn't happen, I, I could say, oh, I merely said it could and it does happen. I told you it could. So you, 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 you've, got, you've got it pretty much covered. So there's a great deal of ambiguity. And it makes it, when you live in a world with that level of ambiguity, it makes it virtually impossible to become granular, virtually impossible to learn how to make 55, 45, distinguish 55, 45 bets from 45, 55 bets the way Aaron Brown says is captures the, the difference between great and not so great poker players. So how great are our thought leaders of today? The short answer is nobody has a clue. Liberals, conservatives, we all have opinions about this. These are just opinions. <laughs> they are nothing more than that. So question, how did the Good Judgment Project win the tournament? And it's by assigning more accurate probability estimates is the short answer, but that's not all that informative. That's like saying you win a marathon by running faster. I mean, that, that doesn't get you very far. What does most accurate mean? Well, the scoring rules we used have been developed over the last 60 or 70 years in psychology, meteorology, and a number of other fields, including statistics. And the basic approach here is if, if imagine, imagine for sake of argument here that you're trying to predict whether it's going to rain or not. And we're going to dummy code reality as zero if it doesn't rain and one if it does rain. And you will see the forecast assigns a 90% probability. The outcome is rain. And the wire score is computed 1 minus 0.9 squared plus, oh, thank you very much. You're essentially deviating probabilities from reality. So when you say 90% likelihood of rain and it rains, you get a great Breyer score. When you say 50% likelihood, you're not going to get a very great, good Breyer score no matter what happens. Say 80% likelihood, and you're right on the right side, you get a good, good Breyer score again. You average across all days, you get the aggregate Breyer score. So you win a forecasting tournament by assigning higher probabilities to things that happen than to things that don't happen, and doing it faster than other people. That's as, it's as simple as that. Now, the Breyer score is called a proper scoring rule because it incentivizes people to report their true beliefs. I can go into more detail on that if you want, but it's basically... It is as if you are betting your credibility the way you would be betting money at a, at a racing track. Okay, so you have a Breyer score continuum. The best possible Breyer score is zero, right? Low scores, as in golf, are better. The worst is two. This is a reverse clairvoyant. This is someone who say, gets everything absolutely wrong. And someone who, if, if there were such people, of course, that would, they would be quite useful. Uh, <laughs> and then you've got the dart-throwing chimpanzee in the, in the zone of randomness. Our best forecasters, our super forecasters, can achieve Breyer scores between about 0.15 and 0.2 typically in a year. Regular forecasters are more around 0.4. The regular forecasters are still better than chance, but not a lot better than chance. Now, Breyer scores break into two components. When you think about what's good judgment, it's, it's a quadratic scoring rule. You can do some high school algebra. You can decompose it into two components. One's called calibration. The other's called resolution. You can be perfectly calibrated, but have poor resolution. So you could be a forecaster who never says anything more than minor shades of maybe. You never go below a 40% likelihood of something happening. You never go above a 60% likelihood of something happening. But within that area, you're perfectly calibrated. So when you say 55% likelihood of something happening, those things happen 55% of the time. But you're not all that informative or interesting to listen to because you never really go beyond minor shades of maybe. So you're perfect calibration but poor resolution. What you really want, what a, what, a, what a great forecaster would look like, would be right along the diagonal. When the forecaster says 90% likelihood, and the forecaster does sometimes go out on a limb and say 90% likelihood, but things happen 90% of the time. 10% likelihood, things happen 10% of the time. 50% likelihood, things happen 50% of the time. And then, of course, there's the God profile, which would be a probability of one. Everything happened. It always happens. Probability of zero. It never happens. That would be perfect omniscient. So that would be, that would be God or an omniscient god, or it'd be also Laplace's demon. 
depending on your uh, <laughs> theological preferences. So now you know how to score them. How do the super forecasters manage to get such great accuracy scores across so heterogeneous an array of problems? And I mean really heterogeneous. I mean, they're predicting, they're going from predicting Grexit to what's going on in the Ukraine to Syrian refugee flows to H5N1, just think all Arctic sea ice even. I mean, an extraordinarily heterogeneous array of problems. How did they manage to do it? The book discusses this in much more detail. I'm going to discuss very quickly four interesting distinctive attributes of super forecaster cognitive strategies in decoding an uncertain world. And we can talk about that more, each of those more or and others in more detail later. Winning requires picking your battles wisely. So if you have a, if you know your high school physics, you should be able to predict Foucault's pendulum, the motion of Foucault's pendulum perfectly accurately. You have a, a great deterministic theory of a perfectly deterministic system. You know, you're moving toward the God zone on the, on the Briar score continuum. Here, it does, there, there's no such thing as an expert on, in roulette. <laughs> it's a pure chance game. It, you can, you can you know, look for patterns until the cows come home. You're wasting your time. And super forecasters know better than to waste their time on intractable problems. There's a Goldilocks zone of questions in which analytical effort pays off to some degree. And the only way you're going to win a forecasting tournament is if you're prudent enough to allocate your effort primarily in the Goldilocks zone. Here, you're just wasting your effort on roulette-style problems and on Foucault's problems. In general, for this level of sophistication, most if there are, if there are deterministic, easy-to-spot regularities, almost everybody else gets them too. So you're not going to win that way. But hurricanes, I mean, that's an interesting case because meteorologists, who have a terrible reputation but ill-deserved because they're among the best calibrated professionals ever studied, that's because they've been keeping score for 50 years. <laughs> they, they, they've been disciplining themselves. They, they, they have subjected themselves to the rigors of, of, in effect, forecasting tournaments. They get quick, clear feedback on how close they are, their probability estimates are to reality. And they've learned, using a combination of human judgment and their models, which have become increasingly sophisticated as well, they've gotten pretty good at predicting hurricanes. Now, of course, they can't predict when and where a hurricane is going to form because you have butterfly effects and all that kind of thing. That, that, that's it's imp it's impossible. But once a hurricane reaches a certain level of maturity, they're pretty darn good at predicting whether it's going to hit South Carolina or it's going to go further north or it's going to hit Florida. They're very they're pretty good at that. They're these little spaghetti diagrams you may you may have sometimes seen on the on the new on the Weather Channel that plot various possible trajectories. And usually there's a cluster, the high probability cluster of little spaghetti strands that tells you where the where the hurricane is likely to go. Hurricane prediction has gotten much better over the last five decades, and I think it has saved, billion, saved us billions of dollars and probably many lives. So I think it's a valuable thing to have done. Now, in, in for, forecasting these kinds of geopolitical events, you have to have some sense for where the Goldilocks zone is, and I'll be glad to talk more about how exactly they did that later. Another thing that super forecasters are pretty good at is using what Danny Kahneman calls the outside view in generating their probability judgments. Imagine you're a forecaster in a tournament, and IARPA decides to ask you whether some dictator in sub-Saharan Africa is going to survive another year in power. And you look at this question, you scratch your head, and you say, what country is that? What dictator is that? <laughs> you, you're really pretty clueless about, you know, you're starting from a very low level of, of sophistication on that particular problem. You know almost nothing about the inside of the problem. But you do have some statistical information that's fairly readily available. You can quite readily find out, for example, how likely dictators are to survive, given that they have been in power a certain number of years, how likely are they to survive another year? And the short answer is dictators are very likely to survive another year as a base rate, maybe 90%, 90% plus. Now, that doesn't mean that's your probability estimate in this, for this problem. It means it's, but it that does mean it's not a bad place to start. Now, if you then discover that the dictator we're talking about is 91 years old and has advanced prostate cancer, you might, might want to shift your probability estimate somewhat. If you also learn that there are major riots in the capital city, again, you want to shift your estimate somewhat. But starting from a reasonable base rate is a good way to win forecasting tournaments. Another thing that winning requires, and this is a somewhat difficult thing to wrap our heads around, it requires avoiding both over and underreacting to news. So one thing super forecasters are pretty good at doing is they're pretty good at avoiding being sucker punched. They're pretty good at discounting pseudo-diagnostic news to which the crowd overreacts. And this just happens over and over again. And you never know ex ante whether they're doing it right. But if you keep score long enough, it becomes apparent that they're doing something right. So 
most forecasters in the spring of 2012, I guess, the Moscow spring, the big demonstrations against Putin, hundreds of thousands of courageous people coming out in the streets to protest against Putin. A lot of forecasters said, my God, you know, this looks like Putin is, is, is shaky. And they, they're, they're, the probability of Putin's survival and the crowd belief took a spike down. The super forecasters were pretty much constant. Putin is staying. They weren't swayed by that information very much. Another thing the super forecasters did that kind of surprised me was Grexit. I thought there was a, much, there was a higher probability of a Greek exit from the Eurozone than they did. One of the things that they discounted quite a bit was the harsh background rhetoric that was coming from the finance ministers of Greece and Germany. They sort of discounted that, and they focused more on the principles, and they focused on certain other variables I can mention later. But again, they, they, they were not swayed by factors that, that, in retrospect, we now know they should not have been. The other thing they're good at is spotting subtly diagnostic news to which the crowd underreacts. So they were very quick to, re to recognize that Putin was going to be taking over Medvedev's job, and that Medvedev was giving up the job. Now, they, that was partly because they were working with the mental model that had a lot of power being centralized in Putin, but it was possible that Putin might want to keep Medvedev in the job another four years, you know, because he was still calling the shots behind the scenes. But Putin decided he wanted to take the job. How did they know? How, what made them so confident of that? What made them spike up prior to the announcement in, in, in September, early September of 2011? The spike up, Russian aviation has a terrible safety record, as many of you may know. There was a terrible accident in which a large fraction of Russia's best hockey players were killed in an aviation accident. Putin, this is a perfect opportunity for a politician to get out front and say, look, I'm the guy who's going to clean up aviation. I'm going to find who's responsible for this and blah, blah, blah. You know, Sherlock Holmes once solved a case, observing that the dog did not bark, hence that the intruder must have been known to the family. Well, this was the politician who didn't bark. <laughs> and the smart money moved in response to the non-event. The smart money, another, another example is another reason why the super forecasters were pretty confident that Brexit wasn't going to happen in the time frame people thought it might this year, was that Greek didn't seem to have a plan B. <laughs> okay, so winning requires avoiding over and underreacting to news. And winning requires moving beyond blame game ping pong, which I think is a particularly pernicious thing in Washington, D.C. The intelligence community is whipsawed between clashing critiques. On the one hand, they're criticized for overconnecting the dots, say on WMD in Iraq. On the other hand, they're used of underconnecting the dots and false negative on 9-11. If you're a forecaster and you work in a world in which you're simply hammered relentlessly for your most recent mistake, and you have no incentives to develop a, a more accurate system for generating forecasts, you are simply going to shift your threshold for avoiding mistakes. Oh, I made a false positive mistake. I'll make darn sure I'm not going to make that one again until you have a false negative, in which case I'm going to make sure I don't make that one again. Kind of ping pong back and forth. Super forecasters really do get it. They get it that they understand what good judgment means. And in, in engineering terms, these are receiver operating characteristic curves. What it means is Good judgment means your ability to achieve a very high hit rate at a very low false alarm rate. I mean, any idiot can predict every war that's going to occur between now and year 3000 by simply predicting war always, right? That's not, that's not a great predictive accomplishment. A great predictive accomplishment is achieving a very high hit rate for your curve to go up very fast early on at a very low false positive rate. Now, if I'm along this curve here, let's say the intelligence community is working along this accuracy curve. All they need to do to cope with political accountability pressures from Congress and from the, from the public is, oh, we made this at one error. We're going to move down and avoid that error here. They can simply go back and forth. They're not improving. Improved accuracy means achieving a better hit rate at a lower false positive rate or achieving a lower false positive rate at the same hit rate or better hit rate. Insofar as you can do that, you are genuinely learning. The super forecasters create little cultures within their teams in which they try really hard to avoid mechanical, mechanistic, blame game, ping pong forms of learning and to build up a reservoir of knowledge that will allow them to achieve improvements in aggregate accuracy over time. They get it. They understand what accuracy means. And this is a trans-ideological meaning, by the way. It may mean that liberals would prefer that you would make this trade-off. Conservatives would prefer you make this trade-off. and You can oscillate back and forth along this function. But both liberals and conservatives should agree that they want to be on a higher ROC curve. That's just a Pareto improvement. It's just a better world. <laughs>
So one question is, how did the super forecasters do it? Another question is, how did the Good Judgment Project do it? So Good Judgment Project initially got started when I was at the University of California, Berkeley. It can, continued through my wife and I, Barb Mellers, were co-PIs, and we, we, we continued with us at the University of Pennsylvania. How exactly did the Good Judgment Project pull it off? There were four big factors, I think, that drove our performance relative to other university-based teams that were participating in the tournament. One was getting the right people on the bus, spotting and cultivating talent. We were pretty elitist about that. The term super forecasters impl implies that we're not afraid of being accused of elitism, I guess. So spotting and cultivating talent, teaming, anti-group think groups, teaching people how to disagree without being disagreeable, engaging in what Andy Grove at Intel used to call constructive confrontation. So get, getting the groups to work the right way. There's a big disagreement among, in, within our, our research program, but where there's a good idea to put people in teams. Because teams have a bad reputation, and, and quite deservedly so for the most part, because teams often are associated with conformity and laziness and lots of, lots of pathologies. But if you engineer the team right, it really does prove to be an engine of progress. We had various debiasing exercises, which I could talk about in more detail, but basically teaching people how to use principles of probabilistic reasoning more effectively in their analysis. And then finally, our statisticians deserve a lot of credit for winning this tournament. And this is, they, they were just better at distilling wisdom from crowds. Part of what they did was quite obvious. They not only created the average, right? So there's a well-known averaging effect. The average of a group of forecasters tends to be more accurate than the majority of the forecasters from whom the average was derived, the J James Surwick, the wisdom of the crowd thing. And they refined that by doing weighted averaging, which is giving more weight to the better forecasters, more and more intelligent, better track record, and so forth. But they did something more than that, and that's somewhat counterintuitive. They extremized to compensate for what's called the conservatism of aggregates. And I want to talk a little bit about that because it reveals something quite interesting about human judgment. And I want to use the context of President Obama's decision to go after Osama bin Laden. And I want to look at it through the lens of the Good Judgment Project framework. How many of you have seen the movie Zero Dark Thirty? Probably many of you. And you won't be astonished to learn that Hollywood didn't get it entirely right. But so it's Hollywood versus history. You have a scene in which, and I guess there's a scene with Leon Panetta being played by the great James Gandolfini. Leon Panetta asking a group of advisors around him, how likely is Osama bin Laden to be in the compound in Abbottabad? And they give various probability estimates. There's another in the Bowden book and in other sources. President Obama goes through a very similar process with a group of advisors around him. Let's just imagine as a thought experiment, let's put aside what the actual numbers people offered were for just a minute and just do a thought experiment. Imagine you're the president and your senior intelligence advisors offer you probability estimates on this question. And each one of them says, Mr. President, I think it's 0 0.7. 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7. What should you, the president, conclude from the fact all your advisors say 0 0.7? And most people say, no, duh, I'll have 0.7. That is true if the advisors are clones of each other. But it's not, it's not true if the advisors are not clones of each other. Imagine that the advisors are siloized. Each advisor is drawing on very different information, apply, applying different analytical principles to different types of information, and has worked independently of the others. And each one says 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7. This actually is real diversity at work. This is the real value of diversity, because what's the answer now? Is it still 0.7, or is it something more like 0.85 or 0.9? Now, it, the answer is not mathematically determinant, because I haven't, obviously I haven't given you enough information, but it is something that's statistically estimatable. And that's what our, our statisticians are really good at doing. They're really good at figuring out how to take the weighted average of the best forecasters and then to extremize as a function of the amount of diversity in those forecasts. Very clever idea. It seemed dangerous at the time because they were then submitting forecasts that, you know, weighted average might have been 0.7, but after the algorithmic magic, 0.7 was 0.85 or 0.9. It worked really well. Now, does it ever crash and burn? Yes, it sometimes does crash and burn, and I want to come back to that point. So now President Obama, in fact, in the real, real world, apparently, he got, he didn't get 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7. He got a variety of different estimates that ranged apparently from, I don't know, maybe a few of them might have been a little less than 0 0.5, but they're still pretty high. And some of them were up to 0 0.95. The center of gravity seemed to be around 0 0.75. And President Obama, when he got these estimates from, from the analysts, his reaction apparently was to shrug and say, look, guys, I don't know what to do with this. It feels 50-50 to me. Now, that is a fascinating reaction, 50-50. 
Now, imagine President Obama had been sitting around in the living room of a, of a TV room in the White House with some friends watching a Mat March Madness basketball game about to start. And they said, what's it likely at Duke University winning this game? And the people around say, you yeah, know, yeah, maybe 0 0.4, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.85. And let's say that the median of those probability judgments is exactly the same as the median for the Osama judgments, 0.75. Would President Obama have shrugged and say, sounds like 50-50? Or would he have said, hmm, sounds like 3 to 1, 3 to 1 Duke? I think we know that he's a pretty sports literate guy. You would have said 3 to 1. Why didn't he say that here? Why the degradation of granularity when it matters so much to become, to become more granular? when granularity really matters? Why are we reserving our most rigorous forms of probabilistic reasoning for our most trivial activities? That is the question. Because we don't believe it's possible to make quantitative probability judgments of these things. We're very skeptical of those judgments. Hence, it just feels like 50-50. So that's a mindset problem. I think the data in the IARPA tournament indicate that we do need a mindset shift. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is the ways in which forecasting tournaments can be used to improve the quality of debate in our society. And I don't know if I spelled forget about it correctly here, <laughs> but what about the forget about it pessimist? What matters can't be forecast and what can be forecast doesn't matter. The rigor relevance trade-off. We've all, you can, you can imagine versions of that objection. And it, there is some truth to it. There is some truth to it. What the rebuttal is, the work that I intend to be doing in the next several years the final work of my career before I retire, I think. And it's on adversarial collaboration and Bayesian, Bayesian question clustering. What does that mean, adversarial collaboration? Imagine we've got two camps on Iran. And there are people who think the Iranian nuclear accord is a pretty good deal, pretty, 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 pretty prudent, and people think it's a terrible idea. And they shout at each other. And they write rival op-eds and they denounce each other. Imagine that you asked each side, okay, there's uncertainty about how this agreement's going to unfold. There's uncertainty about what's going to happen in the next year, in two years, and three years. We want you to come up with 10 questions that you think your side has a comparative advantage in answering. And we ask that of each side to come up with 10 questions that it thinks will shed some light on who is right about this dispute and that they think they have a comparative advantage in answering. So essentially, you're creating, assembling clusters of small questions to address a big one. The big question, is this a good idea or not, you can't put into a forecasting tournament because it's way too vague and it's not resolvable. The only questions you can put into forecasting tournaments are questions that pass the clairvoyance test. Passes the clairvoyance test, if I could hand the, the, the question to a genuine clairvoyant, clairvoyant could peer into the future and then say, yes or no, it did or didn't happen. So it's, it's got to be a clear cut. So it's got to be something about, well, maybe, will Iran have less than 300 kilograms of low enrichment uranium by date X? or Will reformists have a plurality of seats in the Iranian parliament by date X? Or will they test a multi-stage rocket? Or will they do this? Will they do that? These are all issues that some might be, some of these questions would come from liberals, some would come from conservatives. I will submit to you that I think the process of participating in an adversarial collaboration tournament of this form would motivate people to be more circumspect and thoughtful than they otherwise would. A bit reminiscent of the famous Samuel Johnson line about the gallows concentrating the mind. The prospect of imminent embarrassment can also concentrate the mind. You don't want the other side to have better probability estimates than your side had. So it's going to create a competition in accuracy rather than a competition in polemics. And I believe that that mechanism could improve the quality of policy debates. Same thing for China. We have an exercise we've started on China, and whether it be the interdiction of U.S. forces, a violent clash with Japan, fishing disputes, Chinese defense spending, selling UAVs, so forth people who are more pessimistic or more optimistic about Chinese geopolitical intent. Or, Zeke Emanuel is a colleague at Berkeley, and of course, he is, so is very prominent in the Obama administration in the design of Obamacare, and I persuaded him to nominate five questions for a potential adversarial collaboration. I thought there might be someone here who might want to take him up on it. If there are experts on healthcare, I would really, really welcome your participation in this tournament. I think it wouldn't just be Zeke on the liberal side. There should be a team of people on the liberal side, a team of people on the conservative side, each dedicated to answering probative questions. Now, I think Sally mentioned to me that she showed some of the Zeke's questions to someone who said that the questions were a bit on the boring side. Well, that act, there's some truth to that. Forecasting tournament questions are not as glamorous as the big debate questions. Zeke's questions are somewhat technical and nitpicky questions about what the uninsured rate is going to be, the growth of state exchanges, healthcare inflation. 
And he's focusing mostly on questions having to do with equality and inflation. And I, th I think people on the other side of the debate might choose to focus questions on other things, or they might choose to challenge those particular forecasts as well. I don't, I don't know how, the, I'm not an expert on healthcare. I don't have, I'm not an expert on Iran. I'm not an expert on China. I'm not an expert on any of these things. <laughs> but I do believe from a psychologist point of view, from a political psychological point of view, that this adversarial collaboration framework is a useful framework for incentivizing people to become more thoughtful than they otherwise would. So my final slide is stopping conversation stoppers, the naysayers, the forget about it pessimists. It's, it's just impossible to assess the accuracy of probability judgments because, you know, you, you can't do it, right? It's just impossible to make meaningful probability judgments of unique events because you just, you just can't do it. It's impossible to get better at making probability judgments of unique events. I think all three of these things have been shown fairly categorically to be wrong on the basis of the IR forecasting tournament data. It is possible to get better. It's not always possible to get better in every domain. There'll be some domains that really are intractable and improvement is impossible. But I will propose to you that the strong form of these objections has been shown to be false. And that Finally, it's impossible to pose questions that are both rigorously resolvable and deeply relevant because what can be forecast doesn't matter and what matters can't be forecast. I think we can get around that with goodwill among teams of rivals who make a good faith effort to generate questions that they think will stump the other side and then make good faith efforts to assign realistic probability estimates to them. So I think we're in the process of starting to do this. We have not succeeded yet. But if there's any goal I have for the remainder of my forecasting tournament research career, it is in this domain here. And then there's another objection that even if you, even if you could do all these things here, you'll never persuade the intelligence community to expose itself to competition, which they did do to some degree in the IARPA tournament, or persuade high-status pundits to put their credibility on the line. That may be true. <laughs> we are yet to see what hope there might be for the adversarial collaboration Professor Tetlock discusses, and we do not know what kind of future we have to predict. More easily predictable is that I am, again, grateful you've joined us this month to listen to the Bradley Lectures podcast. While the holidays are over and the election is finished, we have some exciting guests on the horizon that should liven things up. If you'd like to be in touch, again, please reach out at bradleylecturespod at aei.org or follow us on Twitter at Bradley Lectures. All the best, and I hope you'll join us next time on the Bradley Lectures podcast from the American Enterprise Institute.